Hey there, you are listening to the B2U podcast, and I am your host, Vanessa Vaughn Matthews, the founder and chief resilience officer of Asphalus Advisors. The B2U podcast is brought to you by CBRBiz.com, a site connecting you with the resources you need to start and run a business in the Charlotte region. We're bringing business resources directly to you. We discuss a wide range of topics like starting and growing a business, navigating government contracts, and how to set your business apart in and around Charlotte. We're talking with small business experts to get exclusive advice on how to start and run a successful business. Today on B2U, we're talking about COVID-19 and what the new normal looks like here in Charlotte. On March 17th, Mecklenburg County entered a mandatory stay-at-home period, but many people and businesses started their social distancing voluntarily days before. All of us are watching the national news, but we wanted to take today to talk about how COVID-19 is affecting local business. What is the risk? What is the economic impact? What does life in Charlotte look like after COVID-19? With us today is Robin McIntyre from the Small Business Technology Development Center and Jose Alvarez with Prospera. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us. (laughs) So Robin, um, when I first moved to Charlotte, I stopped at the SBTDC and they helped me to get my company together um, with, you know, business plans and helping me to think through our, our process and our strategy. Can you tell our listeners what you do at the SBTDC? Sure. So the Small Business and Technology Development Center has been around for about 35 years in North Carolina, and we provide one-on-one confidential business advising services for small businesses uh, across the state. We have 15 offices, and as I mentioned, it's completely confidential. We help folks pretty much at all stages of their business planning. So they could be pre-venture or already in business, and uh, our mission is really to help help their business do better. And the definition of doing better really varies with with the business, of course, because every everyone is unique. Awesome. And Jose, what about you? What do you do with Prospera? So Prospera is an organization that has been around for almost thirty years. Um, specifically in North Carolina, we opened an office in Charlotte about uh, four years ago, and uh, it specializes in providing in-culture, in-language, business support and consulting to uh, Latino entrepreneurs who are either starting a business or trying to to expand an existing one. Awesome. Well, thank you. So uh, just want to start with you guys personally. Um, Jose, how are you personally adjusting to this environment? Like, what's that been like for you? I can tell you in, in my house, I'm a newlywed. I have a dog and we do three things. We walk, we talk, and we cook. <laughs> so what's that like for you? Let me tell you, it's it's our in our home, it's no that that's not different. Yeah, I mean it's the same thing. We cook, we work, and we walk as well. So uh it's been, you know, it, and, and th- that question I've been I've been asked, especially lately, a lot. Um, because uh, at first it was interesting. It was rather I had to adjust to work from home all the time uh but lately i've been i've been actually more effective because i'm i was just mentioning to robin earlier today that uh you know i'm i'm drawn to my station you know I, I, seven days a week i'm all i walk by home huh, i got an email so i just sit in the computer and respond that email and so um and we actually activated our contingency plan within prospera and so this particular office we've been working seven days a week so we've been helping a lot of Latino entrepreneurs, you know, submitting their loan applications, putting together some documentations on even on weekends. So, so it's been interesting. <laughs> interesting is the key word. <laughs> <laughs> or exhausting. Uh, that's another key word. So it's uh, just as Jose mentioned, there's, there's a lot of businesses in the region uh, who need assistance. And so we're literally fielding thousands of calls across the state and, and, um, and helping a lot of people. So while the work is very rewarding, uh, there are a lot of businesses that are that are struggling. And and so it, as a business counselor, you have to be very careful um, to you know to help them as much as you can, but but to also balance you know how much of that weight you're taking on yourself um, because it, it it can be very emotional when you have people on the phone who are you know um, at their wits end and and just distraught with the economic fallout. It's challenging and rewarding at the same time. 
So I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So hand sanitizer, masks and stimulus funds are really not a strategy, right, for managing COVID-19. Um, I run a crisis management company called Asphalus Advisors, and, and our approach is crisis management is 80% communications and 20% strategy. So today we're going to have a discussion. We've got our coffee and we're just going to hang out and we're going to talk about some of the top questions that both Robin, Jose and, and myself are hearing from from uh, business owners now. And more importantly, we're going to talk a little bit about what's next and how do we get over this hump that we're in now. So first question I'll ask you guys, right? So um, I've heard so many questions about funding, about where to get it, how do you get access to it? So can you help us figure out what these different types of assistance programs look like? We're, you know, we're getting insights that it's confusing for people to hear, especially, Jose, if you have a Spanish speaking audience, right? So whether it's federal, state, local, I mean, how do you navigate all of these different programs that we have going on, and then especially if English is not your first language. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. Thank you for mentioning that, Vanessa, because with our particular um, audience, with our end user, it is extremely confusing. Remember, we're helping these Latino immigrants uh, navigate, first of all, how to start a business here. So the handicap that they have is not only the many things that uh, entrepreneurs have, but also language and culture. So that is one, just, just from the get-go, that's an issue that they're, they're facing. Now this crisis hits, they're trying to figure out what's going on, what are the different sources. So the way we are educating our, our audience is you need to understand first, you need to assess where you are right now. And that may include, you know, how much you think you may need, you know, let's put together these different pieces of paperwork that you need to have, profit and loss statement, balance sheet, et cetera, et cetera, explaining to them what that is, because a lot of them are micro businesses who don't have that ready. So after we go through that, then we explain to them, okay, this is how funding works in the U.S. So you have federal level, you have the state level, you have county, and then you have city. Then you have foundations, you have nonprofits, and then you have these different things. This is what a business loan is. This is what a micro loan is. This is what a grant is. So after we explain all of that, then we do, again, assess where the business is, and then we help them figure out which one is their best fit. So, and, 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 and this is a lot of work because, like you mentioned, we have to translate a lot of this information. So it's, a, it's, um, it's challenging, definitely. What other segments of international businesses may you be supporting? I mean, I don't know if they exist or not, you know, with the SBTDC, but I imagine Spanish speaking is not the only language that we're working with, right? As, as far as um, international business development, uh, we, we do have counselors that specialize uh, in, in that area and, and have uh, and support other languages as well. Uh, they're, they're mainly helping folks who have um, international sales, uh, which may, at the present time, which may have uh, been interrupted, um, you know, to the restrictions. And, um, and so they're, they're really focused on, um, you know, uh, keeping, keeping those businesses uh, going. But to be honest, they have the same, um, they need help with the same things as the domestic businesses as well. The first thing I would I would tell people is to reach out to the to the um, the business uh, resources that we have in, in Charlotte. We are, we are so lucky. Uh, business owners are lucky to have uh, so many resources at their at the ready to help them. So so that really is the first place to to uh, to go is is try to reach out and and get some assistance. It, it you know it it's available to. Um, small businesses in the area, you know, tax, they're paying for it with their tax dollars. Um, they need to take advantage of that. So, um, so that's really the first thing that I would be uh, telling folks is, is, you know, to try to get some, some expertise, some assistance, uh, some guidance um, from either, either from uh, the service providers uh, or even companies like yours, right? So, so reach out to people, try to get some, some assistance in sifting through and interpreting, um, not just language interpreting, but just 
interpreting the the rules really is yeah. it, you know it's it's hard even when english is your first language to understand some of these very complicated requirements um, around these funding programs so so that would be the first place that i would start would be to you know to to get help Every year, the Small Business Center at Central Piedmont helps thousands of entrepreneurs learn, launch, connect, and grow by giving them the skills they need to succeed. Central Piedmont Small Business Center supports small businesses with webinars, seminars, and one-on-one counseling. If you are seeking to launch a startup or scale an existing venture, Central Piedmont Small Business Center can provide step-by-step assistance to help you achieve your business goals. If you want to learn more about Central Piedmont Small Business Center, head over to cbrbiz.com. So the Paycheck Protection Loan. Mm-hmm. Um, so we applied for that loan the first day that it came out. We were approved and we were funded. And they've already applied that 1% interest. Wow. <laughs> so question for, for you, Robin. Um, can we still apply and how? If you've already applied, how do you find out the status and do you have to pay it back? So this is one of those, um, um, it depends kind of answers. And it, and it just, it just goes back to what I just said is, you know, you've got to, you've got to understand, you've got to read the fine print. Um, So paycheck protection program is available through your individual bank, right? So um, at this point in time, though there's been more money put into it from um, the federal level, uh, some banks are no longer taking applications. So can you still apply? Um, maybe not with your regular banker, but there are a number of online banks that are still taking applications for it. So as of Wednesday, the SBA reported um, that uh, $90 billion of that second appropriation has already been approved. So we really don't expect that money to to last very long. So my advice would be to folks who are who haven't applied for that yet that do, do have a payroll is to get an application in. Uh, and of course, there's uh, many service providers that can help with that. First place to go is their own bank. Uh, that is also where, if they had already applied, where they would get a status update. Um, though uh, the the sheer volume that many banks have been uh, faced with. Uh, it's making it difficult for people to get somebody on the on the phone to even find out what the status of the loan is. Uh, I know some of the larger banks are telling folks not to call in at all, that they'll be notified by email. So they're kind of in a, yeah, they're in a situation where they can't get any information proactively. They just have to wait. Now, as far as, as paying it back, um, there is uh, there are requirements on how that money is to be spent. And at some point it hasn't been, um, the process for this hasn't been built yet or announced yet, but at some point they will be, uh, business owners who get those funds will need to show documentation of how they spent the money um, and the timing at which they spent the money. And that is uh, whatever that process looks like with their bank, uh, that is how it will be determined what they pay back. Okay, so... Um, so uh, they really have to stay tuned um, as far as process goes. But in the meantime, they really need to keep good, accurate records. And uh, whatever method they use to, to take those to keep those records, they need to be consistent. So, so we're telling folks that they should try to match their payroll as much as they can from before um, this happened to, to current situation. Whatever record keeping they use beforehand, they should use the same one Um, and because that's going to be very important for them to get that loan forgiven as much as possible. Got it. Got it. And Jose, so with your organization and with who you serve, um, what have you gathered from your small business owners? Like, have they received funds? Have they had challenges getting access to those dollars? Um, had they had challenges with banks? What, you know, what are the potential roadblocks that we may not see? Because we're just, you know, some of us are born in this country and, um, you know, may have a different, you know, background versus those that um, may be immigrants here. What right. what have you seen? Well, surprisingly, the challenges that we're seeing with our particular um, end user 
it's pretty much the same what other uh, businesses have been experiencing, especially with the federal programs, the PPP. Uh, I mean, they haven't had any luck at all at the local level. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, more success and more access with the local programs, uh, uh, especially the one, the two loan programs that the county, Mecklenburg County, activated. Uh, we have a couple clients that have been already have gone through the application process and they've been approved and gotten the money. Uh, so what we're seeing is more success in that, at the local level. Awesome. Okay. So um, here's a question I get all the time and I'm dying to know what you guys think. When will things get back to normal? I would say that that it's it's not going to look the same. Um, you know, obviously we um, we have to wait for government government officials to give us some guidance on on you know um, you know when when can we move forward. But I would say that a lot of people's business models are not going to go back to what they were before. I think I think this has uh, been a huge learning um, experience for many for many business owners and. Um, I think uh, so. I think their business models going forward may change, so they'll have an, a new normal. But also, they may come to the realization that that planning, uh, sustainability, um, uh, you know, having having plans in place for you know if something like this were to ever happen again, um, is is well worth the effort. So I think I think um, people will spend a little bit more time thinking that through, um, and and you know, making their business more, um, more sustainable, maybe diversifying, mm -hmm. maybe pivoting altogether from what their business model was before. So, so I don't think it's going to go back to normal from that perspective, from a business perspective. Jose, what's I, your reaction? <laughs> I agree. I, I, I absolutely agree with Robin. I mean, one, one of the beautiful things about human beings being entrepreneurs is that they are very resilient and, 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 and so what we're seeing is, you know, they're pivoting. A lot of them are pivoting that during this painful time, uh, but a lot of them are adjusting their business models and they're pivoting uh, to just, you know, to make it happen so that they don't lose their investment. Yeah. So my, um, I was listening to a YouTube video the other day, and this was really good. And some people may not like this, but, um, the person said, have a funeral for normal. Go ahead and have the service, bury it and move past it because it's not coming back. So that was interesting because I was like, Ooh, that's a little strong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some people may not be ready for that yet, but I understand that. Right. Um, my perspective is normal is what you create. Right. I agree. And what Jose's normal is may not be Robin's normal. Right. I mean, absolutely. Um, but what I'm appreciative of is what we thought was normal six weeks ago has changed so drastically. And I'm hopeful that people can now have perspective and really be grateful for the things that we took for granted. I mean, just the fact that we get to walk outside, it's spring, um, some nights it's raining, some days it's a beautiful blue sky and the birds are chirping. Like for me, that's been, that's been keeping me centered. <laughs> right so <laughs> i just like that normal is what you create right um so question for you guys uh how should your employers prepare for re-entry um so personally we have clients that are in all different types of industries from from healthcare to retail um to to transportation and some organizations are just reopening with no plan, with no strategy, with no framework, right? And my thought process is it's more than just reopening right now. Right now is 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 um, focused on now. We're not focused on the future and what is to come, right? So what are you guys talking about with your business owners as they think about reopening? I would say, um, you know, having a plan, right? A plan, and 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 hopefully they haven't um, they haven't shut down completely during this time. They're still communicating with with folks. They're still marketing. I hope um, 
because there was a study that Harvard did after the 08, 09 uh, economic, um, not say crash, so to speak. Uh, and the companies that that really did well during that time were companies that that kept marketing, they kept communicating. So, so I'm hoping that they haven't closed completely, even though it, if they had a retail location, for example, they may not have, you know, had people able to come in, but hopefully they were still marketing and communicating to their stakeholders. So, but they need a plan really to welcome back their employees. You know, what does that look like? Um, you know, what other protocols do they need to um, to put in place so that the employees feel feel safe and welcomed? Um, they need to be communicating with their vendors as far as supply chains and, and that sort of thing. Uh, obviously, communicating with customers. Uh, and again, hopefully they've been doing that all along. Um, and then, you know, the financial planning piece. So I think those are the main components of a, of a reopening plan that they need to um, to be thinking through. Uh, right now, because that's that's right around the corner for most folks. I I hope. <laughs> yeah, and the and the way we're doing it is, you know, one of the first things that we once we went 100% virtual. I mean, we're we're doing our seminars virtually. We're doing our consultings virtually. All of our 26 employees across the organization are working virtually. Uh, so we are we're taking a look at ourselves first. And then we are providing consulting by example. So we're telling our clients, mm. okay, listen, this is how it's supposed to work. You, you know, you're supposed to be a little bit ready. And then this is how you move on. Um, and it's, it's like, like I mentioned, it's, you know, providing support to these entrepreneurs who are foreign born. Uh, it's quite a bit of a challenge, but, um, but that's part of the work and, 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 and it's easier for us to show them how it's done by example. You need to do it virtually. You need to pivot this way. You need to, hopefully you won't close if you follow, you know, what you're supposed to follow. So it's, um, that, that's the way we're doing it. Awesome. Um, so w- what I got out of what you said, Jose, is it, it reminds me back to what the airlines say. Um, put your own mask on first. Exactly. So in order for you to help somebody else, right, you've got to set the example and do that first. I really love that. (laughs) How do you be an example? Um, Because that's the best way to show people is, well, what are you guys doing? Because they're coming to you for help because they don't know. Right. Um, So for us, we put together about five or six questions that we're asking our business owners. So I want to get your reaction to some to a few of these questions. The first is who or what? is driving reopening? Is it the bottom line? Is it people? Is it politics? What's driving why you are reopening, right? The second one is, what is your success criteria for reopening? So one of my clients said, well, we expect to have 100% of our clients back within the first 30 days. Well, I don't know if that's realistic or not, (laughs) especially when there is a lack of consumer confidence right now because we don't have a vaccine yet. Right. So what is your success criteria for reopening or recovering? Um, When we fast forward two years from now, now what? And what does that look like? We believe that what you do over the next 30, 60, 90 days will impact the next two years of the business. So think ahead as you also think about how you're going to to reopen. The fourth one is, where is the data coming from? So where are you getting your data? Um, I've been on this big rant that education is coming from, you know, the CDC, the World Health Organization, and even those who are in the economy space, right, that are helping us to, to understand the impact this is having on the global economy. But then we have information that's coming from social media, you know, that may be coming from scared friends and family, uh, potential politicians, right? You have all this information and education. How do you, um, you know, filter which 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 one is actual strong data? Because data drives decisions, right? So where are you pulling your data from? Um, how do you define reopening and recovery? Everybody's definition may be different. So what is your organization's definition for what that looks like? And then lastly, why? Um, Even Simon Sinek says, start with why. People don't care what you do. They care why you do it. 
So helping to communicate the why. So let me get a reaction. What do you think about those questions um, in terms of your reopening or recovery strategy? So I'll, I'll put it in, in one phrase. This is the answer to all of them. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. You, you are right. <laughs> You know the data. The data we are keeping a close eye, first of all, at you know both federal and state. Um, we just fall in because you know obviously local follows whatever state and, and federal says. But um, but we're also internally within the organization we're pulling our clients. The clients that we're serving in in, in, in our request for service have increased over two hundred percent compared to last year within the organization. So we've been polling these clients that we've been helping on a weekly basis. And so that's the way we're gathering our own data when it comes to the consulting and the services that we provide. And what we're seeing is nobody right now, nobody um, might be less than 1% of the calls that we're getting of people who want to start a business. The rest is just those who already have something they want to they want to to save their investment. So uh, 99.2%. 9% of those requests are just people with businesses trying to save it. So, Yeah, I would say those are all great questions that business owners need to be asking. And, and some of them may, you know, some of those questions may be hard where they, they really have to take a hard look and an and a objective look, right? They need to remove themselves out of the picture and look at it as an entity, right? So some of those questions need to be answered as an entity, not, and, and try to take the emotion out of it, which is way easier said than done. But the other two comments I would make is um, they need to focus on what they can control because a lot of this other stuff going on out here, they can't control. Just, you know, their focus needs to be reined in. What can I control? And then uh, as far as data, I would say hyper-local in most cases um, mm. because, um, you know, there's so much going on. And, you know, we, we've heard a lot about, um, you know, different parts of the country being very different. It's the same with businesses. Um, so, and of course that does, um, as Jose said, it depends, it depends a little bit on your business model and what it is you do, where your customers are, but the, the more local you can get that data, the better, I think. So that, that would be my thoughts. Um, but definitely that's a good framework of, of, questions that business owners um, should be working through for sure. So I, I love that, you know, local focus because that's where it starts is where you are now. Right. So really understanding your environment. So Jose mentioned some, some interesting trends that he's seeing in, in his business model in terms of not necessarily too many new people that want to start a business, <laughs> which I'm not surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't either. <laughs> but Robin, what, what types of trends have you noticed over the past few weeks with your clients and the types of calls that you're you know, getting? We are trying to um, to counsel our clients to be thinking more um, uh, holistically, like, you know, OK, what if you don't get any funding? Because, you know, that's not everybody's going to get funding. So what's what's a plan B look like? Um, we're also counseling them to look into the future uh, a little bit. So rather than focus on, on money, you know, what are your, what other things that, that you can do, but that, that really honestly has been the main um, uh, focus of the people calling in both clients and non-clients and, and, and literally, you know, hundreds of calls, hundreds of, you know, maybe even thousands of calls across the state. So, and, and, you know, of course that's partially because of the, the national news around the CARES Act and the funding of patients of, of course, you know, we're trying to point folks to local funding opportunities as well. You know, we link to the, the Charlotte ones and, and the other cities across the state that are doing local funding um, programs. So we're, those on our website as well, but be, uh, but we are getting some folks that are wanting to start businesses as well. Not, not as many as as previously, but we have um, we've can our uh, we have a, a startup uh, program called Taking the Leap, and it's a cohort model, four weeks um, four week program. Uh, we converted that to all virtual and uh, we run that back to back every month and we'll probably have about 25 
cohorts, uh, participants in, in all of those, uh, and, and that's statewide. So that's not just Charlotte. I should I should um, you know um, mention that that's twenty five from across the state because it's virtual. They can come from anywhere. But yeah, we're, right. we're seeing some, and it is surprising. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So a couple more questions for you guys. So um, I don't know about your business owners, but I would much rather have a grant than a loan. Can you help to share, um, you know, where can business owners find loans versus grants? What are some creative things that you have in, in your toolkit that you can help to give some of these small business owners so that we can kind of look beyond just what's coming from the stimulus package, but also what may be coming from private industry or other organizations? When when they come out, we share those proactively with clients who who would be appropriate for applying for something like that. But there are some that are that are long term that are always there. Of course, we help clients with those applications as well. Um, but really it's, um, uh, you know, they have to be, I think they have to be prepared for writing proposals and things like that. So, uh, because there's competition for grants, just like there's competition for loans. So, um, so we, we help clients who find opportunities that, that are really, um, suited for them. Um, and, and, you know, um, yeah, everybody, everybody would rather not pay it back. And that's, um, you know, part of the CARES Act is, is uh, part of the EIDL, um, which is from the SBA, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Part of that does come in the form of an advance, which is uh, does not have to be paid back. And then, of course, the Paycheck Protection Program has a forgiveness component as well. So and then there's a lot of uh, other very local uh, small grant opportunities out there. So. You know, when when we look at grants uh, from the, the the CARES Act, really, where is that money coming from? It's coming from workers, you know, and business owners eventually. So so we're all supporting that. We're all contributing to those funds that get uh, shared out to other people that need it. So it's a way that you know society as a whole can contribute to those who who need. So yeah, we we try to um, try to assist clients in that regard. As much as we can as well, although those opportunities are, um, you know, not as great as we'd like them to be sometimes. And the way we, we look at it is, you know, like I mentioned, we, we're helping these entrepreneurs first assess where they are, because right now they're desperate, they're overwhelmed. Just without a crisis, running a business is overwhelming for most of them. So now they're, they lose sight of everything. So what we tell them is, okay, we need to assess Second thing we do is we tell them you need to look for help. I mean, Charlotte has a beautiful, it's a beautiful ecosystem of organizations. Charlotte Business Resources is one example of partners who come together and, and, and work together to help these, uh, these entrepreneurs. So we tell them you need to look for, for help from specialists who know where to get, help you get this either loan, micro loan or a grant. And, and then help you figure out how to apply, et cetera, et cetera. There, are, there, there is no perfect formula for a grant or how to apply for a grant because there are many, like I mentioned before, there are many, first of all, just the sources where they're coming from, whether it's government, foundation, nonprofit. So just that in itself is confusing. Uh, so we tell them you need to assess, you need to look for help from these or trustworthy organizations in the ecosystem and then let yourself be guided by these, by these partners because at the end of the day, we are the ones who know what would be best for each specific case. Yep, absolutely. So we have a few minutes left and we opened talking about the importance of having not only communications, but strategy and thinking about what's next. So I'm going to um, share something that we've been talking through with our 
customers on a framework of how do I think about what's next, right? So first I'll caveat by saying um, in our space, from a business continuity perspective, there really has never been in history an event that is as prolonged as COVID-19, especially on a global level. So, so even you know, business con- continuity professionals like myself are having to go back, rethink, and pivot, right? So this framework was actually created by Dr. David Linstead, um, who is one of the founding members behind the adaptive business continuity approach. And I happen to serve on an ad- advisory board for the group. And so what this is, is a three-phase approach to COVID-19 to normalization, right? Because it's a cultural normal that we're working towards, and none of us really know what that is yet, right? So where we are right now is in phase one. We're in compliance and cooperation. We're sheltering in place. We're staying home. We're wearing our our masks. Depending on where you are in the country, the exit criteria for, for this is when the quarantine lifts. So if you're in, you know, uh, Georgia or South Carolina, there are some aspects of those states that are reopening and that are relifting, right? And as we've seen in China, parts of Japan, um, once these quarantine resolutions have been lifted, some have had to come back into place if the uh, numbers of the virus go up, right? And so we can come back to this compliance and cooperation place over time. It just depends on how the virus performs and what we do as people, more importantly. Then we have phase two, where it's consternation and exploration. And this can potentially last us into Halloween, so October of 2020 or beyond, right? And in this phase, um, we you know, there's a lot of questions and ambiguity. Can I go to the mall? Can I not go to the mall? Can I get my hair done? Can I not get my hair done? Can I go to a sports game? Can I not go to a sports game? And that creates friction. (laughs) Because you have government saying one thing, and then you have private sector doing something different, right? And so you have all these questions, and everything that we want to do is an exploration. No one really has an answer, because again, no one has gone through this before. And so this is a phase where we believe a skill set that we're going to need in our business owners is leadership, right? Being able to lead the troops through so much uncertainty and chaos and the difference of opinion. Now, what's interesting is the exit criteria for phase two is a treatment, not a cure, but a treatment, like a workaround, right? So if I get sick, then what's the protocol until there is a vaccine? Right. I you know, received an email today from an article from a credible source that, you know, now, you know, there's a new 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 prediction that that this may last for two years. So I can definitely see that again, because this is always driven by a vaccine. Um, so just kind of think, you know, thinking about what does that look like over time with so much you know, friction? So as business owners, how, how how do we lead our people? How do we lead our teams when there's so much ambiguity and there's so many questions? But then there's this phase three where the expectation is that there will be competition and then adaptation to a cultural normal. In this phase, people will look will be looking to take over and think about how do they capitalize in this new market, right? So we expect litigation to go up in phase three. There could potentially be foreign investors that come in to local markets. Um, There could potentially be large gentrification efforts. Why? Because larger firms that are, you know, cash, cash heavy, who are thinking about this strategy now may be better positioned to do this later. So I'm sharing this to give perspective, especially to our business owners. To our business community. And our recommendation is spend time now thinking about your phase three, right? How do you compete in an environment that's highly competitive? How do you compete in an environment that may potentially have limited resources? And what does that look like for your business model? Robin talked about pivot. 
right? Everybody has to pivot. Even a crisis management company has to pivot. <laughs> no matter what business you you are in, you can grow and be irrelevant if we don't pivot and make some of these changes now. And eventually we'll get to a cultural norm, whatever that cultural norm is. But in order for us to accomplish the things in phase one, phase two, phase three, we're going to have, have to have a different strategy. That's why we go back to crisis management is 80% communications, 20% strategy, right? So um, we literally have like a minute or two, Robin, Jose, what are your initial one minute thoughts to what we just, you know, talked about um, and what you think business owners can do with a high level timeline to help them think through what's next? Mm-hmm. I would just say that um, some of these timelines blend into the into the next one, right? A little bit. So I think we're we're already at a, at um, you know different opinions. I think in some instances where where we're trying to comply and be cooperative, uh, it, you know, we're already you know getting tired of that. So, um, <laughs> but you know, um, definitely uh, that third the third box is where folks need to be focused their their planning efforts for sure um, you know and they need to think outside of the box I would say you know what their business looks like today may be completely different it may be that they partner with somebody else and you know form a whole different company uh, it just you know they it, it's going to take some uh, some planning and, and I would be um, you know talking to a lot of of customers you know, finding out w- w- what they're doing different now, right? So they can try to be ahead of that. So um, it, it's not going to be easy, but that that's definitely where they need to be spending their time, I think, in planning. Love it. Love it. Jose, yeah, what do you I, think? And I agree. I mean, there, I, I think the first two boxes, I would tell them, you know, just just be patient, you know, so I follow, you know, cooperate. Uh, and as you explore, be patient. And, and, and then the Third one would be just pivoting. I mean, just try to mm-hmm. figure. Let, let let's sit down. Let's, like I mentioned, use use and abuse different e, uh, ecosystem partners to provide assistance and help you figure out how to pivot this uh, business and uh, and then take it from there. I mean, there, there is hope at the end of the tunnel. It's just yeah. being patient and just following <laughs> following the the different uh, guidelines and and. And, and look for help. I mean, there, there is still help. I mean, there is remote help, but at least there is there is help. Yep, absolutely. Um, so we've been on a number of calls, just like you guys, right? And a few things that I've heard that tie into what you just said. One, um, the most important key performance indicator is how much you're on the phone with your customers, your clients, and your partners. This is the time to talk to people. Um asking them what their needs are and what their constraints are, because we can make an assumption, but it's really good to have them on the phone just to ask the question, because then we know how we can serve them, right? Um, And I agree with you, Jose. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Crisis breeds innovation. It breeds creativity. Mm -hmm. And this is also the time where you definitely want to pull and call on your network. So we have about 30 seconds left. Robin, where can our subscribers find you? Uh, So I would just recommend they go to our website, sbtdc.org. And again, it's Small Business and Technology Development Center, sbtdc.org. Um, it's funny you mentioned communications so many times because we ha- we have a number of articles up there on our website about um, you know preparing to reopen you know what uh, analyzing your business and what you should be doing and communication is is one of the the common themes to all of those articles that we have but we have information up there of course that links uh, business owners up to the um, to the funding opportunities as well so that's where they should go. Thank you. And Jose, and for, where can they find you? Uh, ProsperaUSA.org, ProsperaUSA.org. Uh, but I would encourage them to go to CharlotteBusinessResources.com because uh, that's where all the partners are, are listed there and, um, and our contact information are there as well. And may, uh, in addition to the other many local resources available to them posted on that site. Awesome. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. 
For exclusive interviews with small business professionals, make sure to subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts or at cbrbiz.com. And if you like today's show, please rate and review us. If you have any questions or topics or suggestions, send in your requests at CBRBiz on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Again, I am your host, Vanessa Vaughn Matthews, and thanks again for listening to the CBRBTU podcast.